I am Deirdre Byrne. I'm here from Montgomery Community Media, and I have Congressman Jamie Raskin here with me today. So, Congressman Raskin, what I wanted to talk to you about was um, yesterday, the House Judiciary Committee held a hearing on antitrust laws, and um, a, a number of CEOs from big tech companies were at this hearing testifying. Um, at, at the beginning of the hearing, when Jeff Bezos was introduced, um, Congressman Jim Jordan was interrupting, and you were kind of responding to him, but not because he was speaking out of turn, but calling him out for not wearing a mask. I, I was wondering if you could tell me about, uh, I think there were two exchanges yesterday, if you could tell me about these two exchanges. Well, what happened was, um, is that Chairman Nadler recognized my colleague, Mary Gay Scanlon from Pennsylvania. And she began by saying, I want to return to the question of antitrust law and leave behind fringe conspiracy theories. And there she was referring to Jordan and the Republicans who spent their time not talking about antitrust law and anti-competitive practices by Google and Amazon and Facebook. Uh, and what it's like to try to be a small business competing there. But we're talking instead about um, the, the claim that they're discriminated against, that as politicians or their supporters are discriminated against by Facebook or what have you. And it was an enormous distraction and diversion. So, but she, she was recognized for five minutes and each of us gets five minutes to speak. So in her five minutes, she said, I wanna talk about antitrust law and I wanna get away from these fringe conspiracy theories. At that point, Jim Jordan from Ohio just began speaking over her and interrupting her, that is stepping on her time, which is an absolute no-no, you don't do that. And um, so there was an uproar and everybody started saying, you can't speak. And I yelled, turn off your mic and put on your mask because uh, this has been a long, long running disagreement between the Democrats and Republicans um, on that committee and really all the committees, but. Jordan is an especially egregious offender. He has aggressively asserted his right not to wear a mask, um, even when the Capitol physician has recommended that every member wear a mask in committees and subcommittees and on the floor. And so I basically was telling him, zip it, it's not your turn to speak, and put your mask back on while you're at it. So that, that, that was my contribution to that particular exchange. And yesterday, Speaker Nancy Pelosi um, issued a broad mask mandate um, that requires the use of wearing a mask um, in the House chambers. Could you tell me a little bit about this mandate and how thing how this should change some of the problems with people not wearing masks during the pandemic? Well, another of the anti-mask campaigners was Representative Louis Gohmert. Uh, from Texas and Gomer came down with COVID-19 um, and was, you know, he was at the hearing that we did with Attorney General Barr and spoke closely to Attorney General Barr, was photographed, neither of them having a mask on. Um, and he generally has also been very obnoxious in asserting his right to go wherever he wants uh, on the floor in committees without wearing a mask, which is just a public health danger. Look, we don't have a vaccine, we don't have a cure, we don't have a treatment. All we've got is people's willingness to wear a mask and protect everyone else. And all over the world, people are doing it. And in Europe, they've brought the disease down to tiny levels compared to where we are. But we're up, up and away. You know, uh, right when we got it under control in New York and New Jersey, where the hotspots were, you had tech you know governors in texas and florida saying oh you know this is all part of the hoax and it's been overblown and everything and let's just undo the health orders and predictably uh it's an absolute nightmare in texas and florida and arkansas and alabama and in the red states which somehow thought they were ideologically immune to covid 19. now america leads the world we're number one in case counts we're number one in death counts um and there's no other country like it. And we're being banned. American travelers are being banned from dozens of countries around the world, including Canada. You can't go to Canada now as an American citizen. And it's just been this remarkable failure of political leadership from the beginning. Um, we have failed 
to come up with a nationwide plan to follow clear public health scientific advice, which is we should have everybody stay at home for two to three weeks, determine where the disease is, move in quickly to quarantine the people who have it, and then to do contact tracing so you test everybody they've been in touch with and you just gradually, systematically, methodically put the virus on the run. But now we've got community spread. We have more than four and a half million cases in the country and we've lost 150,000 people. Uh, somebody's dying every 90 seconds in America from the disease. And so the thing about Congress, it's not just the health of members and their staffs. And by the way, Representative Gohmert's staff was very upset and wrote to Politico to say they were compelled to go to work and not wear masks as an example of how to get back to work. I mean, that's just perverse. It just makes no sense. But um, yeah, it, it's not just the effect on people on Capitol Hill, but that became a microcosm of the recklessness and the dereliction of duty of the government generally. In other words, if we can't have the people who are supposed to be figuring out a plan, wearing a mask and taking care of each other and being respectful, how is there any hope that we're actually gonna come up with a nationwide plan to unify people? So we've not had the political leadership and we've not had the social cohesion to get this done. And every time we try to move forward, on public health, on testing and contact tracing, we get nothing but opposition from the other side. You, uh, you brought up um, the Politico reporting. Um, Politico reported about staffers feel, feeling frustrated um, when they're at work because of the, the loose mask rules. Do your staffers feel unsafe? Do you, can you speak oh, to that? Well, um, my staffers don't go in. I would never make them go in under these circumstances as long as we can continue to get our work done on Zoom, and we do. Uh, I was startled to hear from uh, Representative Gohmert's staff that they were being forced to go in as some kind of example, and then to be berated for not wearing masks, for berated for wearing masks, and essentially being pressured not to wear a mask. Uh, that's a scandalous way to treat young people. I mean, it's mostly you know young people who are working on Capitol Hill um, but to subject them and their families to this terrible dread disease. And, you know, I, I, I mean, they, those are Republican staffers who worked for him and they called him out publicly for it. I mean, well, why are they showing such terrible dereliction of duty? We got people who are nurses, who are doctors, firefighters, rescue people, bus drivers, people on the front lines every day, grocery store clerks who uh, are all wearing masks and begging people to wear their masks, begging them. Um, and these elected officials cannot be bothered to put a mask on, or they think it's some kind of macho test or something. I mean, that's all part of the idiocy of this administration's response from the beginning, where President Trump said, oh, this will disappear in a few weeks, it'll all be gone it's no big deal, it's like the flu, it's like some sniffles, then it's China's fault, it's the World Health Organization's fault. Everything's a displacement of responsibility. Everything is a refusal to face the facts and to conduct yourself like a grown-up. Um, and, you know, forgive me for losing my temper here, but I've been living this, I've been living with this kind of irresponsibility for months. And now we've got members of Congress coming down with it. And I, you know, I go down there on a daily basis, pretty much. When Speaker Pelosi can't be in town, I'm the uh, Speaker pro tem often. I will go down to take, you know, to, to take the gavel. Um, and they're subjecting me and my staff and my family to this. You know, when we should be getting together using social distancing and mass to come up with a plan to rescue the country. And instead they want to fight about whether or not they've got some kind of constitutional right to wear, to not wear a mask. What we've heard from science is that wearing a mask is the best prevention of the coronavirus that we're aware of at this time. Um, and as you noted, going in there as an elected official, we don't want any more elected officials um, going into work to contract the virus. If there is any anybody who continues to not wear a mask, 
is there any penalty for that? I, any any way to hold someone accountable for not wearing a mask as, as people are still working? Um, first of all, you're right that every time Congress meets, it's like a super spreader event. I mean, all over the country, conventions and conferences and large meetings have been canceled. The Democratic and Republican conventions are not going to proceed the way that they usually do, and they shouldn't. Those are super spreader events. It's very dangerous. One thing we know about uh, the COVID-19, the coronavirus, is that it spreads very efficiently when you get a large group of people together. So what is the U.S. House of Representatives or the Senate? 435 people, 100 people get together from all over the country. So they're flying in from Wisconsin and South Carolina and Georgia and Alaska, all coming together from different places, being together intensely, be a very densely populated place, and then going back out spreading out all over the country, disseminating whatever they had. So that is a super spreader event. So how, how could we do anything other than maintain our social distance and put the masks on? Um, so let's hope that, uh, I mean, we, we can uh, hope for the best for uh, Louis Gohmert. We hope he pulls through this uh, like everybody else um, who's got it. But uh, we do have to, to use this as a learning moment. We can't tolerate this anymore. We don't have a punishment to answer your question, Deirdre, uh, right now for people who refuse to wear a mask, but there should be a sanction and there should be consequences. And we also had a partisan divide over voting by proxy, uh, which I helped to introduce. And I've been casting proxy votes for members who can't come in because they're sick, or a member of their family is sick, or their transportation is shut down because the flights have been reduced to a handful where they can't safely board a flight for whatever reason. Well, the Republicans have been boycotting proxy and brought a ridiculous lawsuit against proxy voting. I was very happy yesterday that Congressman Rooney, who is my colleague, a Republican colleague from Florida, became the first Republican to cast his vote by proxy. They really think it's better for their constituents to be disenfranchised and not to be represented on all the critical legislation we're doing, including the coronavirus response, uh, than for them to vote by proxy. That makes no sense to me. They, you know, and they, they claim that it violated the, uh, the quorum rules. In fact, it's proxy voting which allows us to satisfy the quorum rules because now we can make sure that we have enough members who are involved in the process in representing their constituents. Well, thank you, Congressman Raskin. Um, my last question is kind of on a different subject. So today is the funeral of, um, of your former colleague, Congressman John Lewis. And I was wondering if, if you could, if you had anything you would like to say about, um, about his funeral today. Oh man, well, I, I love John Lewis and, um, this mourning period has been going on for a long time because people are that sad. Um, he, you know, he's everything that we don't see in public life these days. Um, first of all, he's not somebody who lusted after public office. He was in politics as a civil rights protester, like these beautiful young people across America who are out, you know, at the barricades on the front lines fighting um, with Black Lives Matter for a transformation of um, policing practices in the country. That's what, that's how John Lewis got his start as a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And so he started his political career, so to speak, as a civil rights protester. He was arrested more than 40 times. Um, everyone knows that he led the march across the Pettus Bridge. He was first in line to be beaten by the billy clubs and the to be attacked by the German shepherds and swung at by the officers. And he forgave all of them before the end of his life and met with many of them um, because his message was not one of revenge. It was not vindictive. It was about transformation and us being in an interracial process together to get America past uh, the deranged magical thinking of racism, getting beyond that uh, to real science and 
real civility and real decency and citizenship. And so, you know, when he went into politics and got elected to public office, he was such a remarkable force because he spoke with so much moral authority. And that was the role that he really came to occupy in Congress as the conscience of the Congress and never wavered for one minute in his beliefs in nonviolence. Uh, nonviolence as an end that we need to get to be a nonviolent society that, that John Lewis, not the Congress, doesn't depend on John war Lewis and militarism, but also nonviolence as a means to get there. Uh, you don't blow up buildings and stuff like that. And, you know, I don't care whether it's the Boogaloo Boys or the Proud Boys or the Ku Klux Klan or Antifa, whoever is infiltrating nonviolent protests and committing violence is obstructing our cause and disrupting our movement. And John Lewis made that very clear. So nonviolence is not weakness, nonviolence is strength. And he demonstrated that. And uh, millions and millions of people all over America and around the world are mourning the loss of John Lewis. And there are uh, a lot of people who've associated their lives with violence instead and like violence as part of the language of politics. And those people will never, ever be celebrated the way we're celebrating the life of John Lewis.